As we uh, prepare for this se uh, series of plenary speakers this morning, uh, we're kicking off with uh, Dr. Joshua Ringer. Uh, you, on page 23, you do have his bio. Dr. Ringer has been working in international agricultural development since 1995. He is a research and teaching visiting professor in horticulture in the horticultural uh, department at Oklahoma State University. He is also the CEO of Indigdev LLC, which is actually a consulting company that partners with smallholder farmers to develop sustainable food and agricultural solutions. We're excited uh, to have Dr. Ringer with us this morning to speak specifically about post-conflict agriculture. Would you join me in welcoming Dr. Jo Joshua Ringer? Okay, can you hear me? Yes, all the way in the back, very clear. Okay, good. So it's an honor to uh, talk with you this morning to share about post-conflict agriculture, um, some experiences I've had in uh, Southeast Asia. But to start us off, I want to um, remind us of some of the things or events in the, in, right now in Myanmar. So right now, the uh, Rohingya people uh, living on the western side of Myanmar have been pushed across into the Chittagong Hill Track area near Cox's Bazar of Bangladesh. If you've seen the news in the last two or three weeks, or almost a month and a half now, I guess, uh, on the edges of uh, on these mountain hillsides and in lower lower areas, uh, camps set up on these hillsides, muddy now, just as 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 aid agencies, as the Bangladesh government tries to offer aid, and these families were farmers, fishermen, and are now. Finally, after you know two or three years of intermittent conflict, are now in these camps, probably never to return. And so, think uh, that's always helped for me for for me to remind myself as I'm here in the U.S. that there's people hurting, and their lives are forever changed. And uh, that's just one of many peoples that have been. Uh, uh, victimized uh, in uh, many places in the world. You could name many yourself. Um, but that just reminds us uh, to grieve with those who are grieving. So I set that as a, as a start of my talk about post-conflict agriculture. And so I want to um, I want to also thank some people. Start off on a very dark note, but a very realistic note. But also thank people that have uh, brought me here to ECHO. I think first of all, Rick Burnett, 2009, invited me from Vietnam to come speak at uh, ECHO Asia. And just what a great experience that was. And uh, ever since that time, I've, I've, he's been a mentor to me. And a lot of wisdom in what he uh, did in Thailand and, and, and here. Also, Dr. Tim Modis, when he set off, uh, uh, set off to go to his work in uh, Ethiopia, um, I was headed off to the Philippines, so it was great to learn about Liberia from Tim, Dr. Tim Modis. And also, last night, there was a very excellent uh, presentation by Dr. Austin Moore from the University of Illinois about post-conflict agriculture, the macro issues with agriculture extension, and some of the, a lot of the good work that's been done with uh, modernizing extension and advisory services program. But I also want to especially thank my Filipino, Thai, Vietnamese, and Myanmar colleagues that I've worked with over the last uh, 15 or so years. They've taught me quite a lot, and I hope that in this uh, sharing this morning that I convey that, convey the lessons they've taught me. So my lens, my bias, my perspective, I need to tell you that right off. I'm very much biased toward smallholder farmers. Um, when I started off, I started off in 95, two years in the Philippines on Mindanao, so the southern island, 
uh, working with extensionists there with a, with a farm training center, um, learning about um, so, so many of the issues that are there. I then spent uh, seven years in northern Vietnam, uh, north of Hanoi and Thai Nguyen, so the, uh, the uh, city we bombed the most as the U.S. military in, during the Vietnam conflict. Why? Because a lot of cloud cover in Vietnam and um, um, you didn't always have approvals to bomb. They didn't always have approvals to bomb in Hanoi, so what did they do? They go north to Thai Nguyen, the little steel town, and they just drop them there and bomb it. And if that wasn't allowed, then they, as, they, as those bombers go home, they don't want to land with full load of bombs, so they drop them in Laos. Okay? So uh, that was a reality of seven years in Vietnam, dealing also, trying to be a peacemaker. And I want to say right off, I'm not a, uh, I did not, uh, was not in the U.S. military. Um, and uh, I, I've, my role has always been as a peacemaker in ag development. Um, but I do have high respect for those who have, been engaged in, in military action and the, and the cost that it, it, it takes from them. The other thing, um, I, after, after Vietnam, I spent um, four years in northern Thailand uh, working, uh, developing and working with Filipino colleagues and Thai colleagues, working on a cross-border program into a country north of there. And, uh, and then in 2013, I had the opportunity to go into Northern Shan State, and uh, do a agribusiness and uh, research on how do farmers recover from conflict. And I want their voice to be heard in this time. So I'll talk a little bit about, a um, little bit about um, some of the aspects of conflict that I see. I think it's important for us as in post-conflict and recovering to empathize, empathize with what's happened and to understand the depths of the darkness of what can happen in these conflict situations. And then I want to share the voice of these uh, Sean State farmers. Their voice needs to be heard. That's why I did the research. And then finally, some ideas for practitioners. That's the joy of coming here to ECHO, is that all of you, most of you are all practitioners. And you, you're, you're working and m making the effort to solve issues at local, local levels. And they're complex. The other thing I learned from this time in, in Southeast Asia is the, the importance of the power dynamics and power brokers. Those issues that are going down along in the local level. And I also say, I am a spiritual person. So I have done university research and I'm a visiting professor at Oklahoma State University. But the, uh, at, the, at the granular level, at the smallholder farmer level, there are many spiritual issues that cannot be explained by statistics they cannot be explained by formulas or pie charts or whatever. And, and these things are powerful. And so as practitioners, we must engage those and we must understand those, I see, I think, I believe. Now, post-conflict agriculture, ag development and extension is vital. Most of the revolutions and such and the fighting, it comes from people from the hinterlands, from the far out places, okay? But you know, for ag extension, you know, there's, there's many issues for government systems and services for farmers. Decreasing funding, marginalized populations, they're hard to deal with when you can't speak the same language. And, and then the assistance that comes in post-conflict situations. De uh, development groups trying to get a right burn rate, meaning spending enough money. And in these issues, there's often not enough ways you can spend the money. And there's detrimental effects for that. Some of the key terms, we talk about ag innovation systems. Okay, these are important for us to understand as practitioners. Key farmers, I use that term. It's important to identify those uh, farmers for doing effective extension. And key players, this concept comes out of, uh, out of the counterinsurgency in, uh, research. So you'll find it's very interesting in ag extension. Okay, a lot of the principles from counterinsurgency that's been developed in the by the U.S. and European researchers over the last, uh, since 2001, is focused on this key player. So we, as in development, we're trying to find key players or, or key farmers that we can work with, interact with. The key player concept, you find those key people in a network and you take them out, okay? And then once you take them out, you're hoping that the network will collapse. So just if you're looking at ag extension, any of you researchers, just look into that uh, 
material also because it's essentially the same. And then opinion leaders, and then this idea of social capital. How do we build it? We talk a lot about it, but how do we build it? Practitioners like yourself, this is a very important thing you're doing, and also expanding the civil space, helping do that. So what are the, I'm, some of the dynamics in armed conflict? As I've looked at this over and over and over again, I see less as conflict as abnormal, as more it's, it's the norm for human interaction. And this gets right at worldview, I think. You look at nature dynamics. I, I'm learning from those also, the ebb and flow, you know, the pulse theory with, uh, with floods, how that's so imp you know, it's important that the, that the river floods so that it replenishes. And in some ways, you see similar human dynamics. It's, it's, it's messy, it's terrible, just like a flood, uh, but you see renewal. So it's ugly, it's ugly. And then these social points of friction, rub points in a society between upper and lower classes, between different ethnic groups, religious groups, these can explode. Some, some you know, inexplicably so, but they, they happen. And then often that, uh, looking at research in Indonesia on large-scale uh, development projects that, that may be localized violent conflict is how we solve these issues often as humans. You don't hear about it in the, in the, in the news, but it's these small little battles that two, maybe two or three people got hurt or there was a, you know, a lot of beating between different people, but it settled an issue or mediated an issue but then it may flame up into more, it may subside for another year or two. So when you look in the literature, there's, there's a lot of these dynamics. It's, it's a regular occurrence. These type, there's many different types of armed actors, including these conflict entrepreneurs. You know, the, it, people that in times of conflict are able to take advantage of it in this space that's created, the vacuums that are created. And then several, you know, many different characteristics of civilian populations and such. You can look into that later, uh, and also at Meet the Speaker, we can talk about this more. But some of the realities of, you know, how we've improved our effectiveness as, as humans at killing. Uh, the U.S. military, for instance, was very concerned that the, the number of instances in World War II when soldiers wouldn't actually pull the trigger. That's a problem if you're trying to be an effective military force when you're trying to kill. So how do you do that? You do operant conditioning. Uh, it's more about sight and vis visualization. And you become more effective. The kill rate was improved in Vietnam. And now it's even, they've improved it even more with li you know, realistic settings. Uh, first person shooter games are very effective at increasing just the visioning of it versus actually doing it. Okay. Um, the reality that sometimes it's intermittent warfare, it, 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 there's loss, but it can perpetuate this low-level conflict. And humans, we adapt. We adapt to a point. Okay. But eventually we will break down mentally. World War II, we've seen it. Instances in other times where it's constant warfare. Your, your nervous system will break down. And human civilian populations, there's a certain, there's studies looked at in Nepal. If there's bombings, at what intervals, when will the families flee? Just like the Rohingya. When will they actually, it's been going on for two years now or more. When do they actually say it's too much? And what's that point? And then rape is a tool for domination, reward for male combatants. And this question, are we basically good or are we basically evil? Are we all capable of this? without the controls of, of society or our, our, our different people, are we basically good? And this is just aberrations. Then these spiritual dynamics of conflict. We, if you'll see in every one, these spiritual religious beliefs help strengthen. And that's why you see instances where it doesn't make sense. Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. If you look at that movement, did it make sense that they had much fewer resources, it's support from the Vietnamese, but much fewer than Lan Nol, the, the military dictator the U.S. were supporting. He had all the supplies, he had the main, all the advantages. Why were they able to take, take that government out? And it all had to do, I, I, you see that value in something to believe in, in this, this characteristic of humans that if we have an idea that's powerful enough, that meets that need that we not want, 
will latch onto it. This idea of, you know, it's, it's dark, but some of these rebel leaders, what they envision. Joseph Coney, what does he envision? But yet it's powerful, and, and I see that as a creator essence, a broken image of either how we were created or, if you prefer, evolved, but that's there. And then it's use of voice, the word. Words are very powerful, okay? And then excessive alcohol and drugs to in, inhibit inhibitions to lower those and then to numb the pain that's afterwards. So something about a humans we don't like to kill, and you have to overcome that. Now, not all. There's, there's psychosis in some, a small percentage of the population, but there you have to overcome that with some method. Usually it's by dehumanizing the other. And also we need this for recovery. Why do we do military parades in the U.S. after World War II? It's to say, it's okay, you killed for us. We asked you to do this. Now we're saying we welcome you back. When we don't do that, when, more, when societies don't do that, they, they, uh, the, the, the men who go do this are left adrift. How much more those who cre committed atrocities, um, but, you know, of course, someone's terrorist is someone else's freedom fighter the next day, right? So some are the farmer strategies after conflict. So we've seen some of the dark side of conflict. What are some of the strategies? Some is this planting of drought and conflict-resistant crops, like cassava, a, a crop. So what is this idea of conflict-resistant crops? The idea that, and we did a lot of research on this in Africa, in DRC, but the idea like cassava, you plant it, you go away. If you know where it is, you can come back to it three, four, five months later, or even six months, it may still, it'll still be fine if you can find it. No one's taken it as a, as a tactic. One of the thoughts also about um, even in even the Swidden agriculture in the mountainous areas of Southeast Asia where I worked is that maybe even Swidden agriculture is a conflict-resistant farming system due to, the, due to the interactions that's there. But this focus upon farm production versus cash crops, that it's better to do, that, that often it helps with this farm production, um, and, and subsistence, re, re, restarting that is better. This off-farm labor issue is important. And then farmers also doing strategies of diversifying, dispersing their livestock herds. And then also illicit drugs like opium. And then other ways of, and from the literature we're seeing, how, how do you recover that farmer participation is vital. So empowering local organizations, encouragement of active citizenship, but there's always problems in engaging farmers in a true participatory manner. But you're like, hey, we have this problem without conflict, right? Okay? But it's important to reconnect those agriculture networks. And I want you to remember that as we look at the practical side. And then uh, agriculture innovation among these marginalized farmers, which needs to be encouraged. These are all good, nice things. How do you actually do it? That's the tough part. So there's, there's all these theories about conflict. I'll talk to you more about it in, uh, at the Meet the Speaker. I want to talk to you more about a specific time and place. So under uh, this research I did was a qualitative study. So all, was, all it was about was hearing the voices of farmers um, and, and understanding, trying to understand the lived the essence of the lived experience for those farmers recovering from conflict, okay? So, it, for me, I, the value in it was it was getting this into literature. I interviewed 34 farmers, and it was in northern Shan State. So Shan State, as you can see from this, uh, uh, this map, let's we'll see if I can uh, use the pointer, I think. No, I gotta put it there. So if you'll see, uh, northern Shan State's up here, Lashio's right there. That's the main border point into uh, northern, uh, into uh, Yunnan, uh, Southwest China, um, here's Southern Shan State, um, and then Eastern Shan State, Thailand, and Laos. Okay, and so this study area was right in, in this area. But um, Shan State, they've had conflict for a long time. There's high corruption, all the typical things you see from a post-conflict country. And the question is, is it, is it post-conflict, or is it low-level intermittent conflict? And that's what I would say. It's not really post. There's parts of it, but there's still lots of fighting going on, like the Rohingya and in other, other places that you don't often hear about. And then there's this dynamic between the heartland and the hinterlands. Um, Christopoulos talked about this in this recent book by uh, Doc, uh, Dr. Austin Moore in University of Illinois. 
but also the issue of lowland upland. So the dynamic in Southeast Asia was that um, in the areas around the Irrawaddy River Valley, so the river deltas where you developed rice production, that they always needed labor. So what would they do? They would either send out parties up into the mountains or uh, contract uh, close ethnic groups or other tribal groups to go up and, and grab slaves. And so that's the idea where the Sweden agriculture, they were always in fear that they would be captured and pulled down and worked as slave labor in these uh, paddy rice land areas. The same dynamic in Thailand. And so the idea of if you've been in these Sweden fields, Hmong, um, Akai, Lahu, where all their belongings, they can, when they move a house, the joke was in northern Vietnam, all those silly, silly Hmong people, they just, uh, uh, when, you're, when they're ready to move, they burn their house. Well, it's where they put, they put everything they need on their backs, that's what they really have, and everything else comes from the forest, bamboo for building and all those uh, supplies, to burn the house and then they move. Okay. And then there's many layers to these armed conflict situations. So when you go in, please triangulate, please try to understand. If you know Myanmar, there's, there's Shan, the Wa people. There's, there's so many different layers. There's reasons of why they have their grievances. So try to understand those. In the Philippines, when I worked on Mindanao, there's many, many uh, Filipinos from Luzon, meaning the Northern Island, the capital island. They have never been to Mindanao and they say it's a dangerous, dangerous place, which it, it, it can be. But um, on Mindanao, the Muslims, okay, when you're saying Muslims on Mindanao, it's Muslim Christians, they say. Well, the Muslims, there's the Bajau, Tausug, Magindanao, Maranao, all those groups have different issues within the Muslim groups. And then the, the, um, the Christians, so to speak, well, there's the Cebuanos and Ilocanos and uh, Ilongos. And, and, and who is fighting actually with the, with the different Muslim groups? So understanding those issues. So here I want to go through eight, eight themes. And I'm going to go through, I'll give you more detail in the Meet the Speaker. But these are the themes that came out of what these farmers said in northern Shan State. Wa and Shan farmers. And the first thing is that arm that you heard most of all is armed conflict is always with us. Everyone had experienced battles. The younger people had learned conflict coping mechanisms from their parents. And here's the farmer. I'm going to hear it say their voice. I think it's just normal and very simple for us to recognize the battle since we, the villagers here, have so many experiences of the battles. And you see down there on the bottom left and the on the right, those pictures, there's a min minaret there. Now that's, that's in Lachio. One month before I arrived, there had been a small incident, the story was, between a woman, a, Bur uh, a, Shan, a Burmese woman, and a, and a, and a Muslim man. It, they, they were disagreeing about something, it got serious, and before you know it, within four hours, they had the uh, Buddhist Burmese had mobilized and burned out all the, burned the mosque and all the shops of the Muslims and sent them fleeing for their lives up into the hills. Who did they go to, flee to for safety? They fled to the rebel group, which was a Shan Buddhist rebel leader that said, I will protect you. And he provided protection until they could filter back. So slowly over the next couple of months, people started filtering back. Um, but that's just an example of this always there with them in, in that area. The second one, forest is our refuge. It's a predominant place of refuge. They could always go back to it. They flee to it. And that's where the food was. You see the, you see the bamboo shoot there. Some people escaped and ran to the safe place. Some are arrested and forced to be a porter to carry things. Men and women. That was your lot. Either the military or the uh, rebel groups, either one, you're going to be carrying their stuff for you don't know how long. The third one, the fear of the government and militias mitigated by fam familial networks. They used their family networks. Okay, it was the main strategy they tried to cope with this conflict and, and the intermittent conflict. Villagers or farmers are always afraid of not only the ethnic troops, but also the military government. So the villagers, they need to struggle between armed groups and the military. Both sides are ready to fight at any time. Yes, it depended on the personal social activities. I know some of the guys from the military. I asked help from them for the safety of the villagers. Moreover, I organized and arranged the situation of the villagers for when not to go and hide or when to hide. So this idea of 
not necessarily conflict entrepreneurs, but bridge people. People that are influential opinion leaders that are bridging between different rebel groups and able to do that through either influence, family connections. And I just want to make a point, none of these pictures in, these, in this PowerPoint is, uh, they're not from any of Myanmar, it's from my work previously in Vietnam and Thailand. I do that for the protection of the people in it. Okay, the other one, loss of animals and seed stock. That's the biggest problem. You're losing your animals, okay? There's difficulty in recovering because of because the loss of animals, grain seeds, and legume seeds. So what has uh, happened in this area, Northern Shan State, with the conflict? You may hear it coming, you may not. All of a sudden, through the jungle path to your village, there's a whole group of soldiers, either military or mili rebel militia. How do you, you're not sure who they are. And they're going to they're gonna take your... Um, they're going to take your animals, butcher your animals, eat all your pigs, kill your water buffalo, uh, eat all your rice, everything you've got, and then whatever they don't have, well, take, they're going to burn. They don't, you know, to, so they won't leave it for someone else. So all of a sudden, someone that was food secure maybe had good stocks of rice, gone, gone. Almost all the animals died by bombs. Some were killed by the soldier for food. Also, the soldiers destroyed all their stored food. As they ran to the forest, they could not take care of their farm, their animals, and their cornfields, so that their lands were destroyed by their animals and their wild animals from the forest. So the hope was that, okay, once, once it's gone, we hide in the forest, maybe we can come back and get to the animals. Maybe we can find them again. And then finally, the markets are gone. So they lose a the cash crop. The market price has become a, a, unstable. And... And any opportunity they had at these large Chinese or government or military plantations was also gone because the Chinese uh, entrepreneur, pioneer, so to speak, he's, fl he's running back to Yunnan because he, he doesn't want to get killed. Uh, this is a money-making opportunity for him or her. Okay? So, I mean, I'm, I know this is kind of obvious. When, when people are fighting, you can't farm. Okay? But uh, trying to understand some of the details of this. Because of the transportation, it's very difficult for the trader. Most of the traders, they can't go on from these areas. Businessmen that live very far away from these areas where battles took place will not come back to trade. So this issue of farm-to-market transport disappearing. So when you look back, you come in a post-conflict situation, and you're trying to understand the situation of these agriculture networks, the risk that a trader has. So often we... we we disparage the, mid, the middleman, right? The trader uh, that the, the brings, you know, transports goods back and forth and usually sucks most of the profit from the farmer. But in these cases, they are taking the risk. And so I've saved all my life for this small uh, motorcycle or this small little truck. And uh, if I take it into this area, I may lose everything. And I will lose everything, okay? So then, what do I do to compensate for that risk? I charge a high, extra high cost. So the, the farmers are hit even more. Another one is that big agribusiness, and this is a clunky sentence, but big agribusiness, government, mil military, insurgent militias control land and employment. So some of the best agriculture land is captured by the military for counterinsurgency uh, land. You know, the old maxim from Mao is that the fish swim in the ocean. The ocean are the farmers, the, the, the rural area. So how do you get rid of that? You consolidate all the farmers into one place. And that's what the, the Myanmar government did in their four, part of their four cuts policy. Concentrate them around in a place they can control, and then everywhere else is free fire zone. Okay? But now the benefit for the military is then once that's happened... People are dispossessed of their land. These, this land is, quote, unquote, abandoned. Okay? Now, you've got the original issues for Sweden people that in a good Sweden, you're getting about, about, takes about 15 years to get back to the original field. It's not abandoned. It's in fallow. Okay? All the local people, the indigenous people there, they know whose fallow it is, or they have a way to mediate if there's a conflict about it. Once the conflict happens, that indigenous knowledge is either killed or gone or no longer, no longer be able to uh, capture it again. So then the military can sell that land to an entrepreneurial large agribusiness, and then there's labor right there in these farms that are all, you know, these farmers that are all now near the city, and they can, you know, that's, that's the work. 
You also saw the military putting, using former military uh, soldiers, rewarding them with small plots of land and using them as blocking. So they put them around key choke points, key roads, so that they're going to have to go through these villagers first. It's kind of an early warning system before they get to the base. Okay. The thing that bothered me, though, and I'll admit it, was that there was a positive view from many of these farmers of, well, there's employment there. I can finally have money. As they transition to a cash economy in post-conflict, I've got money there if I go work. So I don't, you know, that's important for me. Ah. So the difficulty came around 1990. The military combined people into one region. And then the farmers had to leave their farmlands, their forest areas, between the military and the armed groups. This is the strategy. After that, many lands were abandoned. So many companies and many wealthy people take this land for the company fields. This is the one reason for landless families. And then seven, this prolonged conflict causes movement to safe areas. The young people that go to Thailand, they go to the, the Macau to work in the... Uh, factories and work in the casinos. They go to the border areas of casinos, massive casinos you've never heard about, right on the border with China. And they, with all the dangers that happen with that, we migrated from one place to another in search of food and tried crops like rice and corn, but nothing was implemented as the villagers were afraid of war. And finally, theme eight, but what were we seeing in rebuilding food production? They're finding ways to raise animal, animals again. If they, didn't, if they could flee to another village, they got seed from other farmers. Okay? They tried new methods. But there was a reluctant, reluctance to grow long-term crops. Why plant trees when the only place I own is this little house lot? I'll plant something there. But otherwise, I'm going to grow hybrid corn up on the hillside where the militaries let me lease land or something that's not going to be, I'm, I'm going to be able to realize the, the return in three months. So the same issue we see in many other places as farmers try to mitigate risk. So what's a conflict farmer in northern Shan states? But what's it like? Foc they focus upon any avenue open to preserving life. They rebuild even if it means moving to the city or working as a day laborer. They're wary of armed conflict because everything their parents experienced with armed conflict has been their experience also. They're cautious about forming new partnerships. They feel helpless at, at times in adjusting to the rapid change that is occurring. They temper each game with the realization that any time armed conflict could break out again and they could once again be reduced to fleeing with their family into the forest. So that's a summary of those experiences. So what do we do in refugee ID camps? There's no easy answer. I'm just offering some ideas, perhaps, and what some, some literature has seen and what I saw there in, uh, among, uh, in, in, among the Kachin. By grouping in the IDB camps, starting activities, discussing how to return, they were more likely to return. Farmer Field School, which can be a bulky, expensive uh, extension methodology, but is useful for grouping, was what helped farmers, they, they testified to it, this helped us stay on the field or stay, return to our places instead of going somewhere else and just trying to work build, uh, building bricks or something like that. So the idea from Christopolis is this idea of opportunity ladders, not just a handout, but this is not easy, okay? Looking for innovators and this idea and accepting of decentralized systems. So government extension, our... Um, uh, services that come to one point and then a bridge person takes it across into the rebel area where it's the same material but then they have their systems for dispersing knowledge. Are we accepting of that? But there were indications of resilience. I want to get on here. This idea though that it's intermittent low level conflict. There's still low trust of outsiders. This idea that buffer zones that move back and forth and how to adjust, the, how to deal with those. And then scrug, scrubbing of external indicators. All those Muslims that came back in Lashio, the ones that did, they scrubbed off the, the sayings they had from the Quran that inspired them, that encouraged them. They scrubbed those off. They didn't want to have a sign that they were Muslim. And then escape strategies. How do I know there's a little bit pressure in Vietnam? It's because all the, all the businessmen that I've talked to that can they are trying to get their daughters and sons either into Singapore or into the U.S. And you hear about it also in China because they're not sure what the social, social situation is going to be. 
And then continued acts of resistance, I saw this among the, the Hmong, self-imposed isolation or feigned low competence. We go up in these Hmong villagers, they had been rooted out. You know that Hmong revolution that happened, the short, short, uh, short-term revolution that happened in northern Vietnam. Did you guys hear about that? Probably not. But there was one significant in that local area. So what did they do? They took all the Hmong families, um, they uprooted all these villages, and they, they put them on all these high points spread out where they knew they could control them better. So you go up in these villages, and we'd have, you'd have levels. You'd have the king people, the majority people we see as Vietnamese at, low, at the lowland level. We had uh, Thai and Nung at nev- another level up the mountain, and then the highest point, the Hmong. And they're like, oh, they're, they're not very smart. They don't know anything. They can't speak our language. Then you go up there, you visit, and find that uh, they're actually doing some of the best uh, uh, stall-fed water buffalo raising that I'd ever seen there in northern Vietnam. They said, oh, we're not doing anything. Well, that feigned incompetence to protect themselves. Okay, local power conflicts, struggles against authority figures, and then always this gauging threshold level of resistance. So how do you work in northern Shan State is, you know, one of the th- ideas is um, understand where government agriculture policy is and scaling. Or any, you know, if you're not in one of the ma- USAID, one of the major government projects, they're affecting policy. They're changing the dynamics at the national level. I doubt most of the people in here that we're going to do that. We, most of us are just, uh, we're a small pilot project for some of these bigger projects. And yet the interesting thing is that um, pilot projects can be very effective, usually dependent, whether NGO or government, on the quality of the people within the project. So I would recommend, I, I see the value of us, of each of us, in, in making sure that we're doing quality at our local level um, to demonstrate and to, you know, something that can be replicated, rarely ever scaled up effectively. But at the local level, that's where, that's where you're at. So find out where the government's working, learn what they're trying to do, and then see where you can fill the gaps. Map out those areas, assist farmers to reach up. These are the same as regular extension and, and agriculture development work, but learning those gaps. If it's those transportation trucks, why not buy a sim, you know, the appropriate level and type and fill that gap? What's wrong with that? if we can adapt our program. Instead of coming in like we always often do with this is what we do, and it may fit or may not, but sometimes we also need to fill, help fill that gap if we're really helping the local people. So I'm gonna just give you several key development principles as I finish up. I probably won't have any time for questions. You can talk with me at Meet the Speaker. But develop project plans with just enough detail to get going and to know where you want to go. Develop that vision statement but re- be ready to adapt. So the innovators, the positive outliers, they're going to happen. Don't be blind to that. That's, that's the problem in, our de- in development. Okay. okay, and ideas of process of deliberation, and then using guiding principles, and then those are the metrics that, that guide us. Every village is going to be different. So you have a few core guiding principles that your staff know, that they're, they've developed, and then they share with those with partners, and that's how we gauge. They can always, even a young staff person, can say, I, I think I'm doing the right thing because I'm sticking with these principles, okay? Fail small, so we hear that about failing, you know, failing, so it, but it does, as long as it doesn't kill you, right? And I don't, yeah. So long, short-term, pro, uh, short-term little trials, and then plan for long-term projects. I was blessed to go to the Philippines with a project that had been rolling a program for over 30 years. I learned quite a bit from that. We're, the project, project we ran in uh, northern Vietnam, 10 years. The project we've run, we started in uh, northern Thailand, the cross-border program, it's, it's, uh, we started in 2007, it's still running. But it's uh, mostly local people now. And then exit strategy is joint partnership. Why are you not going with your, your partners you worked with in the village? Why are they not helping you into the next village? That's capacity building at a, at a small scale. And then how do you work? Other ideas on working in conflict-affected areas. 
Build respect for the community and individuals through seeking to understand. And I, this may sound kind of harsh. Sorry, it's my Vietnam time, right? I'm very affected by my North Vietnamese experience. Don't dwell on their lack of resources of them as victims. But grieve with them. Listen to how they are recovering and seek to meet them there. Okay? So I'm not saying, but I'm saying hear their stories. Your story as a development worker is interacting with their story. And the, the benefit I see from not seeing them as victims is that I'm not a, I'm not a savior. You're not going to have this savior complex as much. You're saying, I'm broken and hurt person, and I'm been blessed as all get out because I came from the U.S. or, the Euro or Europe, or I was, a, I was a blessed elite in my own home country, and I'm blessed, and, but I'm broken and hurt, and I'm coming with you to walk together with you. Can we walk together? If we can't, I respect you. I can back away and go on to someone else that wants to walk together. Okay? Respect their dignity by seeing if development efforts can assist them in an equitable manner. Like I said, fill the gaps. I'm working right now. My work in Oklahoma State is with uh, Native American tribal nations, dealing with the Choctaw Nation. You know, I'm American, mixed blood, all that kind of stuff. So I'm a Choctaw member, believe it or not. Okay? But this issue of restarting sovereignty over their food systems, they were dispossessed from Mississippi, pushed into Oklahoma. Yeah, not a very great place. Southern Great Plains there. The Pawnee up in Nebraska, Plains Indians. They fought. The Choctaw tried to assimilate. They tried to copy the white man's coming in, doing all that. Didn't matter. They still got put, dispossessed. The Pawnee, they fought as much as they could. And they got pushed down into a small little reservation in Oklahoma. But this idea of reclaiming and rebuilding food sovereignty and how do you address these, these wrongs that happened, you know, 130, 140 years ago, but they're still raw. They're still there. And how do you protect seed resources? And getting, and so one of the things I do is this idea of, of gifting of produce. So I'm a researcher at working and getting all the approvals to use this seed, but they know they, they got to trust that I will make sure it gets back to them. It doesn't get to some company. And this idea of being authentic, so gifting of produce, that's important, so the culturally. So there's, uh, there's several trends. Large agribusiness corporations, that will be, a, that's a massive trend. As we continue with climate change issues and variability, um, and, the, and the issue of feeding China and the other developing countries, that's an issue. So dispossession by not armed conflict, but possibly increasing distrust of NGOs. So we saw that in South Sudan. We see that right now with the Rohingya issue in, in Myanmar, targeting of NGOs. Used to be if you had an American passport, European, for the most part, except some places in Africa, you were safe. That may not be the case in, any longer. And, and they continue rely, reliance upon spiritual and religious belief. Our scientific understanding hasn't quelled all that. Hmm, that's interesting how that keeps bubbling back up un, unconveniently. And then I've seen this. The westernized elite of all the main capital cities as they continue to develop are more like other westernized elite wherever than they are the lower classes. Okay, so how do you deal with that? Can you engage owners of, owners of corporations in ways that alleviate issues for small farmers? I don't know. That's tough. You need to do a lot of organizational and personal self-reflection. Why are you there? Well, are you doing more good or not? I see development as a political act. You're trying to change the power dynamics. Don't be naive that you're not. So understand what you're doing. How are you dealing with that? And then work with farmers to preserve production so they compete for value in the marketplace. So that's one of my big passions as I do small-scale agribusiness is farmer, poor farmers, those mountain farmers in Southeast Asia and every, every place I worked with, they're not farmers. They're considered just poor people. They're not considered farmers. Okay, so understanding farmers are people that have value in the economy, so to speak. Okay. And then I, this issue of not understanding lo local situation, just this listening to language, radio, and social media that the common people are listening to. When you see conflict welling back up, I mean, how important was in Rwanda the, the radio broadcast for one group? 
And then finally, being peacemakers in post-conflict areas. Authenticity. So with my Native American work, I'm actually growing the squash. I'm doing three sisters, four sisters, those things. I'm gifting the produ produce. I'm, I'm, you know, working, talking through where I can, involved with ceremony. That's important. Deep relationships with local people. And everyone's story and grievances know that the other groups got a grievance that a few more years back was the other way around. So always listen to that. Decide on ethical and relationship boundaries. We often don't talk about this. I mean, what are we going to do? If it gets bad, when are we leaving? And who do we leave behind? Development is a political act. And then helping mediate grievances in ways that are less violent. So we said local violent conflict often happens. How can we mediate that? So I think as I, as I finish up, it's kind of been dark. I've kind of run, run through a lot of this. I just want to say um, for the people that are younger people that are in uh, university, they're studying, equipping themselves. And if you, you're a Christ follower, if you really believe in that, Don't stay in the shallow water of the river on the side. Get out in the deep water. Get out in the deep water where your only reliance is upon this Christ person you believe in. And, and just read some of these stories. For many people, it's service, just su suffering. But I remember, I remember my father, when he took me he worked in the Cambodian refugee camps. And I remember he took me over to one of the big UN camps, and there were a lot of cool young people there. I was just a little kid. He took me there. I don't know why he did, but I, he, had, he had to run an errand over there because he was running supplies or relief supplies. And he said, I went in there and I noticed all these cool young people who were doing incredible work in those re Cambodian refugee camps, just like my father was. And they the way they coped with it. My father told me stories about this. The way they coped with it was, oh, man, that, that Thai, good Thai whiskey, or bad Thai whiskey, depending on your preference. And I just, as, as I, in the places I've been, northern Vietnam, places where somehow we as humans have to medicate ourselves from the great sorrow that we see in this world. And so... For you, um, for you guys that are feeling called to this, think deeply about it. Pray deeply, empathize with the people. And uh, in all our projects, I just pray that you're genuine and authentic. Thank you for your time.